Young People as the New Entrepreneurs of Journalism is our subtitle today. If you're looking for the journalism back panel, um, you can take the red line to the JFK UMass stop where the Boston Globe headquarters are located. <laughs> Just kidding. We, we do like the Boston Globe a lot. Um, I'm joined here today by some really great panelists. Um, first of all, let me introduce myself. I'm David Spett. I work for Campus Progress, which is an organization in Washington, D.C. that works with young journalists and activists to provide training and grants uh, so, that can, so that they can make their voices heard and make a difference in the country. Uh, I'm joined by four wonderful panelists. To my left is Toy Tran, a senior at Boston College and the founder and editor-in-chief emeritus of Gavel Media, a Campus Progress-sponsored news organization that focuses on progressive campus issues. Toy has interned at four different television news organizations from Boston to Rogers, Arkansas to Omaha, Nebraska, where his parents reside. Toy is looking forward to joining the professional media world when he graduates in May. To Toy's left is Jackie High, the vice president of High Labs and one of the minds behind the Kiasta Project, an open technology initiative that addresses critical issues in the future of digital publishing and distribution. She is also a visiting lecturer at the UMass Multimedia Journalism Boot Camp. As a co-founder of the online student magazine, The Amherst Wire, and program director at UVC-TV, she was involved in community education and spearheaded several innovative projects in online reporting. Jackie is also an editor of pegpoint.org and a sense-making fellow at the Pointer Institute. David Cohn, to Jackie's left, is the founder of Spot Us. Is it Spot Us or Spot.us, Dave? Spot Us. Spot Us, a nonprofit <laughs> that is pioneering community-funded reporting. David has written for Wired, Seed, Columbia Journalism Review, and the New York Times. In 2006, he served as the editor of Jay Rosen's newassignment.net, which focused on citizen journalism and the ways that news organizations could explore the social web. David also worked with Jeff Jarvis from buzzmachine.com to organize the first networked journalism summits. He has been a contributing editor at newstrust.net, a founding editor of Bruja, and is currently a fellow at the Reynolds Institute of Journalism. He's a frequent speaker on topics related to new media and beyond. All the way on the end is Megan Garber, an assistant editor of Harvard's Neiman Journalism Lab, a blog that aims to figure out how quality journalism can survive and thrive in the internet age. She was formerly a staff writer at the Columbia Journalism Review, where she reported on education, politics, culture, and news innovation. Megan has served as an adjunct professor of media criticism at Columbia University's Graduate School of Journalism. Thank you all for coming out, panelists. Um, just to let you all know how this is going to work, we're going to have about 45 minutes of moderated discussion, and then we're going to have the rest of the panel devoted to Q&A from all of you. So we have plenty of time set aside for questions. So be sure to think about those as we're discussing young journalists and entrepreneurship. Um, as a first question that I would like you all to think about and discuss, I'm wondering um, sort of about the title and the description of this panel. The sort of description and the title say that young people are the new entrepreneurs of journalism and that there's a new generation of journalists that's remaking the news. I'm curious to know, um, how do you all define young people and do you consider them to be a new generation? Um, how has that generation had an impact on the journalism field? <laughs> and we'll open that up to any of you who'd like to go first. Sure. Go ahead, Megan. Hey guys, can you all hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a really good question because um, I think that increasingly, you know, young people is sort of more of a state of mind than you know an age or a generation. Um, I think it's about sort of being open to change. It's about um, being open to sort of new things and excitement and possibility and um, a big part of that being technology. I think. Um, but I think we see a lot of times um, in the news environment that um, you know young people can be in their 50s and 60s. You know, it's about how they sort of approach the new ecology that we're in. So can old people be in their 20s or 30s? <laughs> <laughs> I hope so, as a soon-to-be one, yes. Uh -huh. OK. Does anyone have a different perspective? I mean, is it possible to say that you can't be a 50 or 60-year-old young person? Because I think some people would dispute what Megan just said. Well, well so uh, I mean, obviously, I, I'll dispute in, in, the, in the literal sense, which I'm sure <laughs> Megan would agree. Um, I, I actually uh, agree with Megan uh, on this, and, and we've talked about it. But just to play my own devil's advocate, um, one thing that I do think uh, is an advantage of, of actually being younger, which I experienced myself in starting out Spot Us, is, um, you know, and this is maybe generalizing for, for younger people, but, uh, you know, I, I didn't have a, I don't have a wife, I don't have kids, and I don't have a mortgage, <laughs> uh, which makes it a little bit more comfortable to take certain, you know, certain uh, endeavors, right? I mean, um, uh, whereas, you know, I, I am actually turning 29 this month, and in another year, no one will trust me, right? <laughs> um, but but I am starting to get to a different phase of life where you know wife kid mortgage all those things might become more of a reality in which case taking the risks of being an entrepreneur 
become a little bit more real. So I do think um, younger people have a real distinct advantage in that um, they do have um, a, a little bit more freedom to take those kinds of risks. That said, I also agree that you know it is more you know uh, on online it's more of a state of mind to be an entrepreneur and to sort of uh, push boundaries than it is an actual age limit type thing. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Another question that I have for, for uh, go ahead, Jackie. Um, I think like when we try to define uh, a generational co cohort per se, uh, it, it age is just a number, but uh, it in terms of what is the environment that, say, this younger generation has grown up in and also that older people might have ad adopted into the mindset. Uh, the technology, for example, that we've grown up with is um, with the internet. And there's a lot of talk about how the younger generation, our minds, are like search engines, but not so much like Rolodexes. So our memory is not that good, but we know how to find something right away, how to make those connections. So the idea of young people perhaps as cross-pollinators uh, seeding ideas, uh, going from one place to another, uh, growing up as part of the Twitter generation, the Facebook generation, broadcasting your activity, young people maybe as being faster learners because all of this information is at our fingertips. You can look something up on Google just like that. Uh, the, the desire to be a self-taught person and then also to rush to the bleeding edge of whatever is being developed. And I think those are characteristics of what that kind of young mindset is these days, given the technological environment. Yeah. Hi. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'm going to be a little bit discouraging about uh, my uh, cohorts. Um, I think that the interesting thing about remaking the news is that with so much media today, it needs to either be really important, like a Libya or a shutdown of the government, or it needs to be really exciting or... Um, in terms of just being really interesting, um, but not very important at all. So, uh, especially with social media, we like to share funny things. Um, so, remaking the news, I apologize, but a lot of the important things we're just not really reading. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you all think that younger people, in terms of the number of years they've been alive, so in the literal sense, younger people are more likely to be entrepreneurs, are they more likely to be trailblazers in, in journalism? Um, compared to people who have been alive for more years? I, I do think, so, so I do think that there's a natural tendency to try and solve our problems using tools that are available to us online. Which, again, not to say that older people don't have that instinct, but, uh, you know, me now versus me 30 years ago, had I been born 30 years ago, uh, again, I, I don't have kids, but let's just say I, I, I had kids and I needed to figure out a carpool. Um, to figure out that carpool situation right now, I would turn online and figure out how to solve that problem by going online. Uh, 30 years ago, that would not be an option. That would not be an instinct. So I do think that there's a, 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 a native instinct now to, it, when, when we come across friction in our lives, to find tools that are freely available online to solve the, that friction. Yeah, but maybe I wouldn't generalize it exactly to say that all young people have that problem-solving instinct. I think it comes down to a personality type. And then uh, also to address the question of are, more, are young people more likely to be entrepreneurs, I think, again, it comes down to personality. Not everybody is born a leader, for example. Um, but I do think that the tools today... Um, we can we have access to anything. We can start a newspaper on a whim, um, and so uh, I think a lot of people are willing to take that jump, whether or not they have the credentials to back it up. Mm -hmm. So I guess you know the conventional wisdom on this is that the people who are sort of unwilling to innovate or less less willing to innovate are, are sort of the ones who are a little bit older and are um, sort of at maybe in the newspaper industry and have been around for many you know more years, many decades, um, and so you know. The idea, I guess, is that there's crusty old white people who are preventing us from innovating, who are sort of keeping the younger generation down. I think a lot of people will say things like that. I mean, do any of you have any feelings about that, agree or disagree? W one thing I would say is um, it's actually less the individuals and more the institutions, mm -hmm. right? So, so first, th there is a, a, a baggage there. But I think it's more y you have these institutions which were organized in the industrial age, right? That's They came about in the industrial age. I mean, if you think about what a newspaper organization is, it's literally an industrial product. It goes through this you know, assembly line kind of, kind of process. And now we're in the information age. And so what we're seeing are 
almost old, crusty institutions uh, that can't be innovative. They're too big and they're too, they have this baggage. They were organizing the industrial age and now they're trying to figure out how to exist in the information age. Individuals, I, I often find that individuals within those organizations uh, can be very forward thinking, um, but you know, they're, they're, it's like you know, trying to push a rock uphill. Mm -hmm. Megan, I mean, you blog about this issue. So is your sense that people you know, who've been alive for longer than others are any more or less able to you know, innovate? I mean, I think it, it, it sort of goes both, way, both ways. I think that, yes, um, the sort of reality of institutionalism can be, you know, an infrastructure and it can also be a psychology. And I think that there's, you know, older people, um, to sort of, you know, continue mm -hmm. that idea, um, in the media, you know, sort of came up with this idea that you start at the bottom, you know, and you sort of work your way up, you know, with diligence mm -hmm. and patience and all of that. And then you sort of earn, you know, the ability to sort of innovate at the end and to sort of, you know, have power within the structure. Um, mm -hmm. and that doesn't need to exist anymore, and yet I think the psychology can sometimes be there um, if you are older. Um, but it's certainly not always the case. I mean, I think, you know, when I think of the most sort of, you know, innovative um, entrepreneurial outfits out there, I mean, I think of Dave, and I also think of places like TBD, and, and you know, a lot, there are a lot of outfits out there that are actually started by older people who have that very sort of young and entrepreneurial mindset. Mm -hmm. so. But you can also innovate and be an entrepreneur within a large organization like the Boston Globe or the New York Times. What Definitely. Have you. Yeah, and actually I would say that, I mean, I, to me, some of the most exciting things going on in the innovation field are happening as sort of almost skunk works, um, you know, within the large organization. So, yeah, like you said, Boston Globe, New York Times, um, at the Chicago Tri Tribune, they're doing a lot of really interesting things. And, you know, these sort of hacker journalists who tend to be young, uh, tend to be coders, but they also have this journalistic um, mentality and very much consider themselves journalists as they should. Um, and I, I think that, yeah, a lot of the really interesting stuff is happening in that context, so. Um, I, I think it's on. Okay. Try again. Hello? Hello? Okay. <laughs> um, I, I do think that there are qualities from coming uh, and working at an institution um, and uh, just with credibility and fine-tuning your, your skills. Um, I find a lot of people who are young don't have that backing that I've mentioned earlier and then they just go out and do whatever they want, and then um, how reliable is what they're doing, basically is what I'm saying. Yeah, and I can kind of speak a little bit from personal experience with that, uh, especially young people who are doing innovative journalism things in college. Uh, the college environment is really supportive of experimentation, of trying new things. Uh, I always say that uh, going to college and doing things is like playing in a sandbox. You can do anything you want, and it's, it's safe there to do that and to fail and to do whatever. Uh, but then once you graduate, you go out into the real world, it's like reality hits you like a freight train. Nobody cares who you are. You're nobody. You have to really prove yourself and uh, build it from the ground up again. Great. That's a good segue into some of the interesting projects that you all are working on. Um, but I also, <coughs> I guess I first want to hear from Megan as to some of the really interesting things that you've seen as far as innovation at big organizations and what kind of things you would define as innovation versus what's not innovation or entrepreneurship at a big organization? It's a really good question. I mean, I think a, when I think of entrepreneurship within that context, I think of, you know, particular projects. So, um, you know, interactives, just sort of ways to make the news come alive for people. Um, you know, it's not so much you know, it's entrepreneurialism in the sort of creative sense rather than the business sense. Um, you know, so this just thinking up ways um, to make the news sort of uh, a living, breathing reality for people, I guess. Um, so, like I mentioned, the New York Times, um, they have an, a whole interactive unit that specializes in this stuff. Um, same with the Boston Globe. We're seeing a lot of tumblers um, coming out of, of big news organizations right now that are sort of using it as a separate space that's sort of, you know, within the auspices of the brand, um, but it's a little bit separate and a little bit more um, experimental and it has a little <coughs> bit more freedom to sort of, you know, not be sort of the fuddy-duddy brand, but it can be something sort of more. Um, so that's what I think of. Um, ProPublica does really interesting stuff, um, and they're able to do it because they're a nonprofit, so they have a lot of freedom from that perspective. Um, and then I mentioned TBD before, um, which is, is having, you know, some problems. Um, do you guys all know TBD? Um, it's an organization in Washington that um, really wanted to make itself a community news organization. It's funded by the same people that funded uh, Politico, um, but they really made an effort to be part of their community, to do a lot of um, engagement efforts, to use Twitter as sort of a you know news dissemination, but also news breaking and news gathering vehicle. Um, and they've just done some really cool things, and it was um, a very watched experiment. Um, so those are the ones that come to mind. If I think of any others, I'll, I'll chime in, but. <laughs> 
great. Um, let's talk to the rest of you about um, your experiences with innovation, with taking on new projects, with um, building organizations and companies. So we'll start with David since you're right next to Megan. Tell us a little bit about um, some of the projects you've begun and why you decided to begin them. Uh, sure. So the one that uh, I, I work on right now is called Spot Us at the URL spot.us. Um, and it launched in November of 2008. And what it is, it's community funded reporting. So it's the act of distributing the cost of hiring a reporter across many different people. So as you can see, for example, uh, the one on the left uh, is Energy Solution a Bad Idea has raised a little, uh, I can't see, $59, $59, dollars $130 left to go, things like that. Um, lots of people giving five, ten dollars each. You can either click fund this and donate your own money, or click free credits, take a survey from one of our fine sponsors, and then that will create money for the story as well. Um, what I say right now, actually, uh, when when it started, uh, Megan, you made a really good distinction between like sort of creative um, entrepreneurship uh, versus business. This started very much as an experiment, um, and and what I say now is, is as an experiment or in that sort of creative entrepreneurship, I, I kind of consider it a success, and I'm and I'm usually very cautious about labeling something a success, but as an experiment, I consider it a, su a success. And the question now is, is can it be a success as a business? It, we're uh, on an independent nonprofit, um, and that the, the jury is still out. I'm happy to say that we're actually comfortable for at least another year. Uh, financially, and, and our initial grant uh, from the Knight Foundation, which is how we were able to get started in that creative experimental phase, uh, has has run out. Um, and you know, uh, it one thing that I, I would say is that you know, I, I my background, I was a, a technology writer. I got my master's in journalism from Columbia Journalism School, and uh, you know, I, I value that that background and education, but it it did not prepare me for being an entrepreneur. You don't learn a lot of the things that I've had to learn, uh, you know, hitting the ground running in running your own organization. And, and, you know, some of them even sound sort of like trivial and trite, like, you know, payroll and taxes and things like that. But, you know, learning how to manage a cash flow, um, you know, creating a business plan, things like that are, are not things that, at least when I went to journalism school, which is not that long ago, um, you know, was sort of off the table, not discussed. We were just sort of starting to broach, you know, um, social media, but you know, not fully. And so, you know, the the one thing that I'd say is is that, um, you know, there there's no better education uh, than than actually just going and doing something. Um, and you know, there's going to be some mistakes, and I've certainly made some mistakes, and and but you, I've learned from them, and uh, you know, that has, uh, I think, you know, something that will. You know, if anything, again, Knight gave me the opportunity to sort of try a creative experiment, but the gift that just came to me um, that I, I'm not sharing with the rest of the world was just the, the experiences and the lessons that I personally learned, which are completely invaluable and I think can help me, you know, future uh, later on and, and are things that I think every young journalist should experience. Great. Can I actually add one thing to that? Sure. Uh, just uh, to what we were talking about before with sort of the, the age distinctions and, and all of that, um, just this idea of the psychology again, um, Dave makes a great point, which is I think that part of the psychology <coughs> of the sort of institution of journalism had this separation between, you know, the business and the editorial side. And, you know, this idea that if you do the business part, you do not do the editorial part. And if you somehow get your feet into both, there's something wrong. Um, and I think that that mentality has carried over a little bit, um, you know, and it, it can be sometimes a challenge for <coughs> entrepreneurialism in the business sense, um, because a lot of journalists um, don't want to get into the business side of things because it's somehow, you know, not what we do. Um, so anyway. Great. Jackie, do you want to tell us a little bit about your projects? <coughs> Uh, so I actually go to Amherst Wire first. Yeah. When I was a student journalist at UMass Amherst not too long ago, uh, some classmates and I started an online multimedia news magazine called the Amherst Wire. And one of the things that we really wanted to try uh, when building a news organization from the ground up was to really take advantage of the web as a medium and all that it can offer. So if you go to the features pages, features page, yeah, right there. Uh, what we spent a lot of time on was developing these interactive multimedia features as a way of presenting the news. And Economic Stimulus 101, uh, that was a package that we put together back when the federal government was voting on the huge economic stimulus during the recession, which is, the question was, how do you break down a topic so huge, so intricate, into a way that people can sort of, in little bits, digest. Uh, so what we did was we interviewed um, a lot of economics professors in the five college area. 
uh, and then put together this package. So if you just like, you can click around on it and the videos are broken up into short clips because the advantage of the web is that it's pretty much the, uh, there's no space limit. But the limitation of it is, it's not the <laughs> how much space there is, it's what's the attention span of the person who's viewing it. And so by, by breaking down the topics into short digestible clips, that's how we approached this issue. Um, yeah, innovating on Amherst Wire was made possible through the use of open source web tools. And I think that's probably one of the greatest strengths of the web, that it creates a very low barrier to entry for innovation and for people to try new things and to connect with audiences in new ways. Uh, and so, which segues into the current project that I'm working on now after graduation, uh, and that's the Kiosta project, which is addressing a major problem that we're seeing now with the web uh, in that it's being fragmented by uh, a myriad of mobile devices, a lot of proprietary platforms, and uh, that are frankly quite costly, both for producers who want to put their content onto those platforms and for the, the news audience that want to access it. Uh, sometimes these devices are so expensive <laughs> that those that uh, may not be able to afford internet access to begin with, I mean, you can forget about trying to get uh, an e-reader or a, a tablet. So Kiosa is uh, it's an open source e-reader as well as uh, basically you can th sort of think of it as WordPress for uh, e-reader distribution. So in the same way that anybody now can download an open source blog software and get a website up and running very quickly within about five minutes, the aim of the Kiosa project is to make that possible for uh, mobile distribution. Great, thank you. Way. Yeah. Excuse me for the uh, mint, my throat um, allergies. But anyways, um, can uh, the bcgavel.com please? Mm -hmm. uh, so I go to Boston College, and journalism uh, at Boston College, um, student journalism has been um, kind of old-fashioned. Um, when I first entered, our main school newspaper printed twice a week. Um, the Heights, uh, it's it's award-winning and stuff, but, um, and they would update their website um, when they uh, would print. So um, after doing that for two years, um, the College Democrats approached me, um, and so I left the Heights and uh, started The Gavel, which is um, the progressive newspaper, or news source, but we also uh, update with breaking news um, as constantly as busy college students can. Um, and then we also started providing video online um, with our print content. Um, and another newspaper just started that this year. So we, we started um, August 2009. Um, and yeah, so that's what the gavel is. Great. So it sounds like, um, based on what I know at least, the gavel is receiving funding from nonprofit sources, Campus Progress, as well as other organizations, student government at Boston College, right? Yes, actually, um, something that David uh, mentioned, um, the filing taxes and all that stuff, we uh, became a, a nonprofit 501c3 organization, and we as students had to figure out all the IRS things, and I had to talk to them on the phone, so. It was very traumatic, but uh -huh. I learned a lot. <laughs> and David's project also is nonprofit, receiving grants. What made you decide to go nonprofit as opposed to putting ads on your site or trying to get sponsors in other ways? Um, w so I'm not like a, a, a nonprofit. Uh, there's sort of like a nonprofit mafia. Uh, <laughs> I guess I am part of it. But um, we went nonprofit because the nature of the site is asking for people's uh, donations. Uh, and I really just wanted to get up and going uh, as quickly as possible. Um, and sort of, you know, have a, a, a position where we could earn people's trust to give us money, essentially towards the story of their choice. So nonprofit seemed like the right way to go. Uh, the other thing is actually, again, something you learn: creating a nonprofit, um, you know, chartering it and getting is is actually itself a very long and arduous process. But I was sort of grandfathered into an existing nonprofit. Uh, we started out as the fiscal as a fiscal sponsored project, and then I ended up becoming the president of the of the nonprofit. So it sort of seemed for me it was the quickest, lightest, easiest way to get going, uh, which is also something that I would say that I've learned is you know 
uh, finding the quickest uh, you know, path of least resistance as a way to get going and being a nonprofit seemed like the immediate way. I'm actually, uh, you know, I think that there is a uh, space for for-profit entrepreneurs and nonprofit. I'm, I don't think that one is bad or the other is good, et cetera. Um, it's really about, you know, what makes sense. And I do think if you're asking for donations, then nonprofit makes a lot of sense. Uh -huh. Interesting. And how did you find about the Knight Grants and decide to apply for that? I was uh, a student at uh, the Columbia School of Journalism, uh, and, you know, they talked about it. It, was, it, it. it started in 2007, and I saw, you know, the winners of 2007. One of them came and spoke at Columbia, and, and I looked and I said, I could come up with a bunch of crazy ideas. <laughs> Um, and, and literally, you know, uh, you know, Knight doesn't pay me to say this, so, uh, but to their credit, they're really looking for crazy out there ideas, and the first round of applying is really, really easy. Um, you know, I, I sort of uh, just applied on a whim, to be honest with you, um, and then once I got into the second and third round, started taking it more seriously, but it was just sort of, I had these ideas and I fed it to them. Uh -huh. Great. And Jackie, um, did Amherst Wire receive any funding, either from advertisers or from student government or other nonprofit sources? Uh, no, not while I was there, uh -huh. Amherst Wire. It was pretty much, because there, the operating <coughs> cost was so mm -hmm. low, all that we really needed to pay for was a domain name and some hosting. So mm -hmm. the students, the student editors, all just pulled together our money and we did it. Mm -hmm. Great. It doesn't cost that much, right? How much did you pay for that, roughly? Uh, probably $10 a year for the domain. And, and then web hosting is also about 8 to $10 a month. Yeah. It's pretty cheap. Um, and also, of course, if you go to WordPress.com, among plenty of other sites, you can get free web hosting. Um, terrific. So I'm wondering whether there are any specific traits of your youth that you think you know, have made you better entrepreneurs, better at running your organizations, um, and just you know, overall sort of more effective and um, successful. This is off the shooting off the top of my head, but but uh, and and a little stroke of irony. I actually think uh, public speaking in a weird way. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, from youth, uh, I I was vice president of my elementary school. I should have put that <laughs> on my resume so you guys knew that. But um, you know, I do think, and I've seen uh, entrepreneurs uh, and and people describing projects, and uh, you know that pitch. Will, will, you know, let's just you know call a duck a duck. Uh, you know, being able to pitch what it is that you're doing, you need to be able to articulate clearly, simply get people energized and excited about what it is that you're working on. Um, and I don't know, you guys can tell me maybe I suck at it, but I like to think I'm good at it. And that, I think, has been incredibly useful and helpful. And I've seen other people that um, are not able to crystallize and clearly articulate what it is that they're working on. And that can be you know, a death kill. As someone who grew up uh, around computers and with the internet, I'd say that um, I'm a voracious infovore. Like I love <laughs> just consuming all kinds of information from a multitude of sources and then later on making connections between different things that are going on and then synthesizing that into new ideas. So I think that, that is, um, young people today that have that tool at their fingertips and they're comfortable navigating it and comfortable uh, searching for things, uh, that's kind of an advantage. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so now let's segue a little bit into some of the challenges that you all have faced as entrepreneurs. And for Megan, challenges that she's noticed in startup organizations and entrepreneurial groups. Um, and I guess we'll start with Megan in that particular question. You know, what do you see? Are there any patterns as far as the groups that are less successful than others, mistakes that they might be making, and things that they sort of um, grapple with? Hmm, it's a really good question. Um, I mean, I, I think. I, I guess I would say the, the, the thing that first comes to mind is, um, you know, is lack of flexibility, I guess, for a better term. I mean, you, you, I think you want to assemble a group of people um, who have the sort of, you know, dedicated mindset, um, you know, that you want to sort of accomplish great things together. Um, but sometimes if you're not flexible enough in, um, you know, kind of adapting to new situations, um, I'm trying to think of a good example for you guys. But I mean, I, I hate to use TBD as an example because I feel like there are a lot of caveats right, they there. Get beat up a lot lately. They do get beat and I'm not beating them up because I think <laughs> they're, they're fantastic. But they, is it, do you guys know the story of TBD? I asked you before if you knew. Okay. So basically what happened is they had this awesome idea. They assembled this awesome team of really cool, dedicated, hardworking people. Um, and then their, their funders basically decided, um, you know, you're not, you're not getting the revenue that we want uh, in a nutshell, that was sort of it. So they're not the best example in this respect, but um, to sort of use them, I mean, I think that you need to sort of, 
you need to be adaptable and you need to be focused on the business realities of what you're doing. I mean, it's one thing to have an awesome idea um, and it's another thing to have an awesome staff who's you know, excited about realizing that idea, but if you don't sort of know the lay of the land economically and financially before you get started and really invest yourself in um, the economic realities, also the legal realities of what you're doing, I mean, all those sort of nitty gritty, very unsexy things, um, if you don't have a full appreci appreciation for those, um, I think it can be problematic. And so, you know, as, as good as uh, inspiration is, it can also sometimes hurt you, um, which is a very long way of answering that question, but. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, one of the big things that I've read a lot about the problems at TBD is that they had an advertising staff that actually was working for the television station, which had competing interests. So the television station was also owned by the same company, but it had competing interests as everybody working on that website. So they were not really working for the best interests of the TBD people. Um, and that really caused a lot of problems, I think. So that sort of goes to sort of understanding the realities and making sure that everybody's on the same page. How about the rest of you? What other problems have you seen? So a problem that I've seen and uh, uh, several times I'm trying to, the, the best way to explain it, I guess, is to say project management. Um, again, my, my background, I was a tech reporter. Um, I'm not a technologist. I, I can program at like a second grade level. I'm, I'm what we would call quasi-technical, which is just good enough to break things on my site. Um, but I do know how to communicate with and work with programmers and manage them. And I find that to be absolutely invaluable. And I've seen a lot of projects uh, that don't know, you know, project leaders who don't know how to do that, don't know how to, uh, you know, communicate with more technical people, and that can go down a, a really bad hill. I mean, uh, you know, the, the classic uh, sort of, this is a, a caricature of it, but someone has a brilliant idea and they say, well, it's like Facebook with a dash of Twitter, and they say, go build that. And the programmer's like, well, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. <laughs> and then the programmer builds something in their mind, and the two don't meet, and then they fight, and they, that draws out for six, seven months. Um, so I think you know a, a lesson that I've seen more and more um, uh, over and over again is not that uh, you have to be uh, a, a hardcore technologist, but you do need to understand what is and isn't possible, uh, what time frames are realistic, um, and how to manage developers and their workflow, which is different from the journalistic workflow that you might be more comfortable with and might be more aware of. There are two different workflows and you need to know how to manage that other workflow or else you, you're going to end up pulling out all your hair. What would you recommend to someone out there in the audience who wants to learn that? A really good tool, actually, is uh, that, that sort of trained me. Is, it's called Pivotal Tracker, uh, which has been free. And I'm told that in July they're going to start charging, but not for nonprofits. But um, Pivotal Tracker is a tool that was developed for what's called agile and iterative development for developers. And agile and iterative, that means something to developers. And you need to understand how to manage an agile and iterative process. And Pivotal Tracker, I, I refer to it as the, the iPod of, um, of project management. It's pretty intuitive and simple to use drag and drop, but it, uh, it allows you to organize a workflow for developers that fits their natural workflow or what, what they train themselves to work in. Great. How about Jackie and Tway? What problems have you seen or dealt with in your organizations? Uh, speaking, I guess, in more broad terms, uh, especially for young entrepreneurs who got their start in college, I like to think of the first year or two immediately after graduation sort of as crucible years where like really high pressure intense situation that can either kind of make or break a person um, because once again just sort of the expectations of how the world works versus how it really works sometimes doesn't match up and uh, when you're when you're young when you're a student you're idealistic you have big visions grand plans uh, and you want things to happen right now and then when you actually get out there into the business world it's really just a day-to-day -day slog. It's an uphill battle. Uh, every single inch you have to fight for. And sometimes that can be really hard and frustrating uh, if, if you're experiencing that for the first time. Yeah, do you have any examples of challenges that you maybe didn't anticipate in advance? Um, I think because college can sometimes be a bubble or a bit of an echo chamber, and especially that's amplified with the use of social media uh, and uh, Twitter and Facebook, and so when you, you say something, it gets echoed all over and you feel pretty good about yourself. It's like, oh, I'm being heard. And then uh, that kind of dissipates a little bit <laughs> once you're out of the bubble because suddenly the pond is an ocean. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so you, you can get discouraged when sometimes you say something and it seems like nobody's listening. Yeah, definitely. It's way. Well, I'm excited to join the real world now. Um, <laughs> But I think the hardest part has been um, 
One, because BC is a liberal arts school, so a lot of the technology people aren't really there, but luckily we were able to find one person who can uh, play around with WordPress and figure that out. Um, I think uh, the, the, a reason why I, I won't be an entrepreneur or journalist, I don't think, um, at least for at this point, is because um, I feel like there's so many websites out there, and in order to, the, the two things that are really hard is are to get legitimacy and also um, to make money, not enough to just run the site, you know, hosting or whatever, but also um, I've got to eat. So um, th those things are kind of um, what's holding me back from uh, doing entrepreneurial journalism in the real world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I think you do diminish a little bit the effect and the importance of founding a publication, an organization, you know, that produces a website, print editions on your campus, right? I mean, what... You talked a little bit about this, but why do that as opposed to try to, you know, become editor in chief of the mainstream student paper on campus? Why do you believe in new projects like the Gavel? Um, well, I think it's true that journalism is going online, and um, the Heights had been on campus for 90 years. Um, they had had this this kind of machine that editors were just kind of a cog in, and you just produce, produce, produce. So it made it gave me a great work ethic, but um, it was just so hard to change. Um, with it and so actually now they're kind of playing catch up with us um, we were the first to really reach out on Facebook and Twitter and blogs and things like that so it's kind of cool to see them kind of slowly catch up with us but I could have never made those changes within um, yeah mm -hmm. so it sounds like as a new organization you were a little bit more agile as far as innovation mm -hmm. and doing new things so you were able to sort of push the mainstream student organization with what you did mm -hmm. Um, all right, another question for all of you. Do you think that there are any differences for male and female entrepreneurs? Are there greater challenges for women who are trying to start up their own organizations or companies in journalism? That's a, I'm not sure how to answer that. I, um, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I think that any of the problems that already exist, um, I can see sort of transferring over. Um, you know, just the idea of, you know, if a woman is assertive, um, you know, that's perceived differently than if a man is assertive. Um, but I'm not sure if I really see any, actually. I mean, um, besides those sort of embedded cultural assumptions that are there, um, I think from a sort of business perspective and from a creativity perspective, um, I don't see much difference. What entrepreneurial women have you written about or covered? Um, well, Michelle McClellan, um, who does a lot of work with the Knight Foundation, um, does a, she has the, she basically created this database in conjunction with the Knight Foundation of um, local news efforts, um, which is different from starting your own business, but um, but you know started that. Um, Susan Murnett um, runs a site in in Oakland. Um, yeah, there's a bunch of women. I mean, I think to your point, I think there are more men doing this, um, but I'm not sure if that represents sort of a systemic. Um, you know, gender challenge, or if that's just sort of the way things have shaken out. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anyone else have a different perspective? Uh, well, I'll add one more to the list of, of uh, and uh, Amanda Mickle, who's at ProPublica, yeah. or at ProPublica, um, and again, she's, I, I would sort of consider her more on the creative uh, entrepreneurial, but like, she's doing really, really interesting stuff around distributed reporting, getting lots of people to contribute, and she's like a master at it. Um, but, uh, you know, I, th I I wish I could say no, that there isn't a, a difference or a disparity, but I think if I'm honest, I think there might be one, but I don't think that that's necessarily a reflection of journalism, but maybe the larger uh, American culture, uh, and that's being reflected there. I'm going to amend my answer after that. <laughs> um, no, you're right, because just, just like we were talking about before, Dave, the, I mean, the idea of, you know, having sort of real world considerations um, when you are starting a business. I mean, obviously for women, you know, having a family is, that is a very, you know, big real world consideration. So I think from that perspective, that does sort of factor in. But. There's this perception though of journalism as kind of an old boys network. Um, do you think that's still true? Has innovation sort of shattered that or no? I don't know if it's necessarily shattered that, but uh, so, I, you know, the Bay Area is home for me where um, the media scene there, the people who are involved, is very diverse. And I uh, recently uh, was at a, uh, uh, an event in uh, the Midwest in Kansas, and it was, um, you know, I, I, it was like all old white men. And I had never seen the sort of old boys club of, of newspapers until I had been there. Um, and I, I was really sort of shocked. Um, I do think that there is a little bit of, a, of a, an old boys club. Uh, and it certainly has been shattered in that, again, the barriers to entry are, are so minimal now 
um, you know, anyone can start a, uh, you know, a site. That said, again, um, there is a sense of legitimacy. Um, and, you know, uh, in the end, you know, again, if we're honest, uh, having money and being able to back up what you're doing uh, gives that sense of legitimacy and outreach, et cetera. And so I think that there's a lot more work that can be done um, along all sort of, you know, uh, race, gender, uh, et cetera, lines. Great. So Jackie and Toy, I'm wondering what general tips you would offer to someone out in the audience, out in the larger world, who wants to start their own organization or who wants to innovate within an organization that they're a member or an employee. What general advice do you have from your own experience? I guess a few, th a few <laughs> things. Um, it depends if you want to strike out on your own or join an institution and change from within. Uh, in either case, uh, don't expect things to happen overnight. Uh, also, don't immediately go in expecting to topple the old institutions. Uh, you have to sort of uh, work with them. And also, if you do want to strike out on your own, it's good to find mentors, uh, to find the older people that have been around the block a few times. Uh, and and to, to for them to share their experience with you. Uh, my friend and I always uh, joke around that it's all about fake it till you make it um, because a lot of times with new things, like I said about legitimacy, um, if you're the person that's starting it, you have to have the most faith in your project, whether or not you want to bang your head against the wall that night. Um, because if you don't see legitimacy in what you're doing, then no one else is going to believe you and uh, feel that same thing. So fake it till you make it. <laughs> okay, thanks everybody. I think we're now gonna segue into audience questions. Um, I wanted to take a little bit of a quick moment to talk about Campus Progress briefly, which I neglected to do at the introduction of this panel. Um, our organization provides grants and trainings, as I said, to young people. Uh, my coworker, Katie, has either passed out or will pass out quarter sheets to tell you a little bit about everything that our organization does. Katie? Oh, yeah, I was trying to kind of like take it all the way around the room. Not sure we passed out as many as we could, but the three of us, let's raise your hand. Kay Steiger, my coworker, Katie Andriuli, and me, we'll be around afterwards if you have questions. But those of you who are on college campuses or um, out in the larger world and want to get grants to do entrepreneurial journalism projects, definitely talk to us because we do fund a lot of things like the Gavel of Boston College and other organizations that are getting started or have recently begun and want a little bit of a boost as far as their funding concer is concerned. With that, um, we have questions from the audience. We do need you to ask them directly into the wireless microphone um, because this event is being recorded. So we have a wonderful volunteer who's going to be passing the microphone amongst you all. Oh, I can decide. OK, great. A lot of power here. Let's go to you in the front row. Hi. Um, I had a question about promotion. Um, what sort of promotion models have you found to be successful or unsuccessful? Have you tried to branch out? I, I, it seems that a lot of you have been working with online platforms, obviously. Have any of you tried to branch out into print media or at least print promotion? Um, and has that been successful? And if you could specify, I'm sorry for not mentioning this earlier, but if you could just specify whether the question is for anyone or an individual and specific panelist. Oh, th this, is, this question is for anyone. Great, thanks. So in terms of uh, promotion for Spot Us, I think two immediate things come to mind that have worked pretty well for us. Uh, the first one is, you know, and maybe I should uh, explain this a little bit further, but uh, or a little earlier, uh, Spot Us is a little bit more of a platform than an editorial force. And so uh, what we do is we partner with other editorial forces. And it's th in their interest to promote their, their pitches, their projects on our site, because they'll make money off of it. And so, uh, you know, that's kind of unique to spot us. But one thing I'm, I'm also a big evangelizer of is this idea of collaboration. Um, and, you know, you might be a smaller site. Try and see if there are, are things that you can provide to other sites uh, so that you sort of, you know, band together and make maybe a, a larger bark than, than any of you individually. Uh, the other thing that was uh, very helpful was uh, again, creating a narrative about what we were doing from the very start. Um, you know, again, in 2008, um, even before we had launched in November of 2008, uh, I had started sort of publicly writing about uh, community funded reporting and Spot Us in like early 2008, and um, really created a narrative about the experiment itself. Um, and so there was a little bit of gawking uh, at this idea, uh, but I invited that gawking. Uh, in fact, even before Spot Us officially launched, we put up a wiki. So we bought the URL, $10, put up a, a free wiki, wiki.spot.us. If you go to it, you can still see, um, if you scroll down, you'll see a line that says, check out what our beta looked like. And beta might not even be the right word. It was like 
Spotus version 0.0001, um, and that actually got written up in the New York Times. Uh, and I almost was pissed off. I, you know, come back in three months when we have a real site. But you know, there was this sort of narrative that was being created of like, oh, these guys are doing something very different. Uh, let's follow it. And sort of creating that narrative can be really huge. Uh, that, and of course, I am a relentless self-marketing whore. But um, but you know, that that sort of is. I think you do need to be prepared to uh, you know take that narrative and own it, and then you know put that out there. And um, I can sort of answer that from two perspectives, I guess. The first is, um, so where I work at Neiman Lab, um, it's not, you know, kind of, it's in some sense a self-started business, I guess. And um, we started back in uh, 2009, and, um, you know, we're just basically a blog, and uh, started a Twitter feed at the same time. And Twitter became a huge sort of component of, of who we are and how we're known. Um, I think we now have... 40 something thousand followers, something like that. And um, people often think of us just as a Twitter feed, but it's been a great way to sort of, you know, get our posts out, get the word out. Um, and then from the sort of more universal perspective, I would also say to sort of not just think about your product in terms of individual stories, um, you know, depending on what you produce. Um, I think if you just think about your product as information and as education in some sense, that can really free you to sort of you know, extend your audience and really get the word out. So I actually wrote about on Friday, um, California Watch, which is a California-based investigative, uh, yeah, there it is, <laughs> uh, news product. And so basically they, they created this um, like 19th month long investigation about seismic safety in public schools um, and realized that a big component of their target audience for this, you know, very rigorous work of investigative journalism was kids. Um, and so they created this coloring book that contained their reporting and, you know, encapsulated their reporting, but it was aimed at kids. Um, and I just, I thought that was really cool because it was, it's investigative journalism, but not in any sort of traditional framing of it, so. Great. Let's go to the gentleman in the blue shirt in the second to last row. Hi, thank you. Um, my name's Erhard Graf. I'm from Harvard Project Zero. And um, everybody on the, on the panel, you know, you've, a lot of you have started your own outlets and obviously that kind of entrepreneurship um, that represents a certain fire in your belly you know that which comes from civic responsibility or some other need to produce journalism and I'm curious how you do that uh, or how you spread that to your peers or to the other students on campus in order to get writers and to get people to contribute how do you inspire that same kind of sense with them or alternatively how do you use that casual desire that that your peers might have to be published or to want to produce something and incorporate that into the publications that you're working on? Um, yeah, I think the the hardest thing about starting is as an, as an editor-in-chief is not only the um, operation, but you're also a salesperson to everyone. Um, and how I found uh, to be successful is to really market that we're new and we're exciting, whereas the other people are kind of um, just used to everything, uh, the, the way that things are working and they're satisfied. Um, and I think with anything new, people get excited about that. Um, and then also throwing parties and uh, dinners is, are, are also good things too. Did you do negative advertising to it? Did you sort of bash the heights? Well, not explicitly, okay. but um, uh, uh, I see. <laughs> but um, the well, it wasn't my idea because I, <laughs> I was my training from the heights. But um, one of our campaigns was that news doesn't happen every Monday and Thursday. It happens all the time. So um, yeah, that was one of the things. One of our advertising campaigns. I like that. One of the big initiatives that we did uh, was community education uh, in terms of the tools that you use to produce journalism, uh, and especially the new tools, uh, the multimedia and web. So what we would do is we would have open newsrooms and open workshops where any member of the community could just walk in and learn uh, like skills that are not uh, then are not just related to journalism, but you can also apply to life, so uh, important job skills. So that could draw people in, and so come for the skills, and then walk away also with the, the excitement of uh, working in a newsroom. And just, you know, well, I, I think th having a, a really clear mission statement that is that does represent that fire in your belly, um, what I say for Spot Us is, you know, um, <coughs> My rallying cry, or I guess the, the arc of my career, has been about pushing uh, transparency and participation in the process of journalism. 
Uh, and that phrase of, of pushing boundaries in, in, the, uh, in transparency and participation in the process of, of journalism really means something to me. Um, you know, I've, I've really sort of spent time thinking about that, and uh, that is sort of a rallying cry. So it's not, I'm not saying spot us because spot us is the coolest thing ever and spot us, spot us, spot us, spot us. Um, mm -hmm. But more about that mission of transparency and participation in the process of journalism, which there are lots of different ways to say that. And that's actually uh, a, a much more effective way I've found uh, to try and get people to sort of share that vision is not the brand, um, but the mission. Really interesting. Did you in the purple sweater have a question? Well, yeah, we have to wait for the microphone. Hold on. Sorry. That's okay. Oh, I, I just kind of, I, I think it's interesting that you guys like all like kind of went out and was into entrepreneurs and it's kind of, it feels like you kind of knew that you wanted to do news and you wanted to start your own things. Whereas with me and a lot of my friends, is that we all graduated and we applied for the jobs and we didn't get jobs. So it was like, if you want to work in this business, yes, you get your nine to five, but you also need to start a blog. And I guess none of us has really figured out how to make money off of it. <laughs> you know, we're doing it for the love and I get freelance gigs because I, people have, I have a place where people can come and see the work that I already do. So I guess looking at it from that angle, do you have any advice or um, know anyone that how do you make money off of a blog that is not mes not necessarily news driven but it does give information. So, so one thing that comes to mind is it's uh, it's not like I sort of woke up one day and just started started this. I mean, I uh, very much uh, believe that it's better to just get started in doing something you're passionate about. And what uh, I started out as a freelancer myself. Um, and you know what I would say is you won't make money uh, off your blog, but you can sort of make money from your blog, right? Uh, that sort of becomes a, a space that you can sort of own. It's, think of it as a living resume. Um, that that's one way to sort of think about your personal blog. It's, it's a living resume that then you can use to try and get more work later. Um, and again, this is maybe a little nerdy, and, and, it's, and I'm almost embarrassed, but in in like 2004 and five. Uh, for example, I was really active on a site called Dig. Does everybody know Dig.com, which now everybody's like laughing at, right? But <laughs> but I, I was very very active on it. At one point, this was my nerd cred. Uh, I was a top 50 digger. Uh, I didn't make any money off of Dig, but I made money from Dig uh, in that it sort of built up a reputation. That was actually where my my name Digi Dave came from. That was my handle on Dig, and then I started a Digi Dave blog, uh, and then I started becoming a tech writer, um, and that really helped me. So. Investing your time in something that you're passionate about, again, make sure it's something that you're passionate about, um, and trying to build up that sort of living resume on whatever platforms seem appropriate for you. Uh, it takes, uh, again, it takes a lot of time. Um, I, I often say that journalism is a uh, apprenticeship kind of model, and the problem, though, is, is that the industry, which normally had that apprenticeship model, is, you know, sort of having its issues, and so we're sort of our own apprentices, which is... Uh, again, maybe an oxymoron, but but there there is a way to sort of you know pull 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 out of that. It's it's certainly I'm not saying that it's easy, um, and it doesn't happen overnight. But I, I do actually think what you're doing, uh, you know, if you're really passionate about it, is the the, the best thing to do. You know, um, don't don't just because you can't get a job, sort of throw your hands up and say, well, I, I give up. Great. Let's go to you in the third row here. <coughs> Hi. Um, I like, David, I like what you were saying about your mission, and um, I would love to get inside your heads a little bit about what you're, how you're thinking you would like to change the world with the work that you're doing. And I don't mean it in pie in the sky kind of thing, but really, what's your mission? What are you trying to, how, what are you trying to change? What are you trying to do that's, that's going to um, bring something new to journalism, bring something new to media? and to us, old people. Um, well, I mean, again, uh, I, I, I'm certainly not like anti people over 30 or anything like that. But um, so if I did have to pick a pie in the sky, then, then I want uh, to become the Rupert Murdoch of nonprofit journalism. <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, uh, you know, again, I, I think that mission of being of, of bringing a sense of transparency and participation in the process of journalism. The reason why I believe in that so much is that uh, it's it's almost you know, journalism is not passive, right? Uh, and, and it sort of was it used to be, right? It was like here's the news and it slaps down on your doorstep. And you know, there there can be a critique that you know um, when people are participating in citizen journalism or participating in journalism. It might not even be quite as professional or as good or et cetera. Um, 
well, here, let me, let me reframe it in a better, a better way. The Guardian, uh, when they did their uh, experiment where they crowdsourced looking over these documents from Parliament, right? They, they took the documents from Parliament and they split it up and they had a lot of people looking through those documents, right? And in the end, if I recall, they didn't really find a red, uh, you know, a red herring. They didn't find anything. And someone could say, oh, see, this it's crap. They didn't even find anything. They didn't have a Watergate after thousands of people contributed. And I'd still say, you know what? If you find a project that gets thousands of people reading government documents, um, that's a success, right? That is people engaged in democracy, right? Even if they don't find that, you know, you know, some guy, you know, spent millions of dollars inappropriately. That is a, a fantastic example of people engaged in democracy. And I think that that through making journalism more transparent and more participatory is a is sort of a gateway drug uh, to being more active in in their um, communities and societies. Um, well, it's my, it's my personal belief that it's within a community, a strong, healthy community in which we all fully realize our humanity. And journalism is the narrative of a community. It's the way that a people talks to itself. And uh, however, sometimes with the advance of technology, uh, it can break down a community as well. It throws people into isolation. I, I heard somebody mentioning earlier at this conference that these days we're all stuck in our own little personal device bubbles. And it's critical that the people have access to the tools uh, that allow them to talk to each other, to tell each other their stories. Uh, so that's what motivates me. Tway, do you want to take that one? Well, uh, I guess just for um, Boston College, it's a pretty conservative um, school, and so being the progressive um, outlet, um, it, it really gives the various groups that feel underrepresented um, or that their opinion isn't heard. Um, so I think uh, it, it really gives them a platform to do so, basically. Great. Next question. Let's go to you in the blue scarf. Hi. Um, I was uh, just curious um, to ask you, as uh, young entrepreneurs who are interested in, uh, in media and journalism, um, if there are any um, chances that you'll be looking into expanding some of your, entre like sharing your expertise, entrepreneurial expertise, in areas like the Middle East and North Africa, in some countries that, in, in by virtue of the new transition, have huge um, openings because they're reforming democratic societies and one of the most lacking components is that uh, because of decade, uh, decades of media, uh, state controlled media, you have an entire class of youth that has operated as an alternative media through blogs. But now that the restrictions are removed, some of these people need to uh, take their act a notch up to professionalize and basically plant the seed of a new healthy media operation that ultimately would strengthen democracy. Uh, I'll be very interested to, to hear your take on, um, on that and I'd love to chat with you later about it because I'm uh, doing some work related to that. Anyone want to take that one? Well, I, I actually have a friend who graduated last year and she's been in Bangladesh teaching English um, and um, she also wanted to start a uh, newspaper there um, and she came to me to ask for some advice and so I told her some advice but she said that they needed so much training because the idea of a newspaper there they don't really know um, they didn't really have what, an idea of what a, a newspaper is so I think um, just from my experience as a student and my friends it's really important for um, uh, not only to go there and teach English for example but maybe to take on um, a journalism project or something like that to train people um, in other countries to uh, do media, basically. Sorry? Oh, okay. the, the questioner says particularly the youth. Uh, the youth of those countries, or hmm. yes, um, I I don't have a I don't have firsthand experience with that, um, but. Uh, yeah, I can maybe get back to you when I uh, talk to my friend next. Anyone else want to take that one? It requires a far greater mind than mine. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? Yes, Steve, in the second row. 
Hi, this is for Jack and Dave, and uh, follow up to the earlier question <coughs> on jobs. Um, I know that you're both involved with multiple jobs, multiple projects, you have your hands in, in multiple things now, you've worked on multiple projects up until this point. Do you ever envision a time when you're going to have a nine to five, one job life, or is the reality here that the, the future of journalism involves juggling multiple projects and doing multiple things? Uh, I don't think I've ever had a nine to five job in my life. It's pretty much 24-7. <laughs> um, but you know, I've gotten used to that. And especially uh, since the, the topic of this panel is about entrepreneurship, it, it takes a lot of hard work to be an entrepreneur and um, to make things happen if you want to shape the world the way you see it. You can't just sort of clock out at the end of the day. It's an ongoing process. Uh, an analogy that, that uh, I started using uh, is first written by a guy named Paul Bradshaw, who's a journalism blogger in the UK. Uh, there's an element to uh, the professional arc, which again, uh, my professional arc had I been born 30 years ago, I would be, you know, at that stage of my career, nine to five job, you know, maybe elevated from a cub bead reporter to something. Uh, but now the arc feels a little bit more like gigging, um, like, like as if I was a musician and, you know, Spot Us might be my sophomore or junior album, right? Um, and there is an element where it's like, you know, you're, you've got this gig and, but you also jam with this other band and maybe, maybe if that album goes well, you'll tour with them a little bit. Um, so that's maybe trying to put a positive spin on what you're describing because I actually have fun with that. Um, there, 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 it's actually kind of invigorating to, you know, have these various gigs uh, and, and come out with various albums. Um, and, you know, maybe the, my next album, uh, the critics will hate it or, or not, you know, who knows. But um, uh, that's, uh, so, so in some respects I'm agreeing with you, but uh, I actually don't look at it as a, as a, as a hindrance. I, I think that it can be kind of empowering. Also to tack on to that, uh, I don't mean to sound all gloom and doom, <laughs> but uh, it is hard work, but it's also really fascinating. Um, holding down multiple jobs, doing multiple things in many different fields, outside of journalism, inside of journalism, you really get to see all sides of the world, all sides of a picture, uh, that if you were just in one job all of your life, that you might not get to see that. And to be able to cross-pollinate and to be able to take ideas from one side and apply it to another and then back again, I think that that is really a perk. We have a question up here, a gentleman in the gray-brown shirt. Hey, um, I'd like to know if you can talk a little bit about, because uh, um, uh, Toy was talking about you, you weren't able to really um, change the institution while you were um, in the established newspaper. Um, and I know um, with, the Am with the Amherst Wire, uh, the Daily Collegian at, the, at UMass wasn't quite um, getting into online multimedia the way Amherst Wire did. Um, can you guys talk um, about filling that gap? Um, how much does that play a part in terms of um, that service that isn't being rendered by established um, established institutions, by established um, journalism bodies. How much does that play a part, finding that niche and finding that gap and catering to um, the need of the younger um, younger generation and the older generation that might be looking for a new way to, um, to consume the news? Maybe this one can go to Megan, perhaps, since she sort of sees a lot of different projects. Sure. I mean, I think we're, we're in this really sort of strange time right now because we're, you know, Clay Shirky has called it a revolution, and I think rightfully so. Um, you know, the old institutions are sort of getting um, torn down faster than the new ones can be built up. And I think um, what we're going to see in the future um, and what we're seeing sort of fulminating right now is all of these niches sort of, you know, building up. And we haven't seen them sort of fully realized, but I think that um, more and more people are becoming empowered to sort of say, you know, oh, I, I don't see, you know, X type of coverage in my community. I will create that, which is awesome. Um, you know, and, and I think that will just sort of become more and more common and, and more and more of the future. And then I think also, um, you know, institutional media or legacy media or whatever you want to call it will sort of bring that up into their coverage, um, you know, and everything will just be sort of increasingly networked um, and diverse in that respect. So, I mean, I, I, that's not a full answer to your question, I know, but it's hard to answer, I think, because we are in this sort of weird time um, where things are right now, you know, germinating. Yeah, um, something that a lot of students in Campus Progress's network grapple with 
uh, is the question of, you know, if organization X does something that's very popular, should they create a new organization to do the same thing since that's so popular? Or should they do something that's totally untouched and hasn't been done yet? And I'm wondering if any of you have thoughts on that. Yes. <laughs> You know, you know, I don't know if there's a right or wrong answer. I mean, it really, it's what they feel like uh, will work for them. I, I mean, I think the only danger in, in straight copying something else is it might be harder to have that narrative and they might not be quite as passionate about it. But, you know, if, if there is a reason why they feel like they need to do their version of it um, and, and, you know, and they're passionate about doing their own version of it, then, uh, you know, go for it. You'd have to come up with a different name, otherwise you'll get sued. But other than that, um, I think it's you know. In fact, there are a lot of uh, um, when 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 I started Spot Us, uh, to my knowledge, uh, you know, we were the first one doing what we're doing, um, and now there's actually a couple different uh, competing sites, which I actually love. I think that's great. One, it sort of val I feel like I'm not some crazy guy, um, but you know, I, I like to think that there's actually a, a rising tide lifts all boats. Uh, kind of situation. So, um, and, and I think another thing, again, this goes back to that collaboration, um, you know, you can create a sense of co-opetition um, with sites that are very similar. But if you want to do something completely different, something niche, you know, if that's where your heart is, go for it. Let's go to the gentleman in the striped shirt in the fourth row. Hi, very much to that point. Um, is there any fear amongst you of info exhaustion? It seems that uh, more and more you hear, especially with young people, uh, between Facebook and, and everything else, that there's so much media that it's almost impossible to consume it all, and it's daunting in attempting to. And it seems that such an, a uh, situation would have a negative effect on entrepreneurialism and on uh, you know, the business aspect of that. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I'm just curious as to your thoughts as to that situation and ways to address that or the future of where that's even going. Uh, absolutely, that's a hugely valid concern. Uh, and in some ways, you know, going back in time, uh, the the newspaper was a great format for consuming information because it was it it has it in a summarized form, but it also drills down deep. Whereas uh, on the internet, it doesn't translate as well, especially with hyperlinks. And I think that's sort of the information overload effect, where you're, you're reading an article and it links to something, you click it, and then like two hours later, you've got 50 tabs open. Uh, <laughs> so th it's a, that's actually one of the problems that we're trying to solve with the Kiosta project, which is more of a, an evolution of that original format as opposed to just taking the web and plopping it onto another new shiny device. It, the, the, the ability to go online as well as offline so that you're able to consume information in a sort of isolated atmosphere to be able to drill down deep. Uh, there have been studies shown that the way that consumers uh, take in information on tablet experiences is different than if you're sitting in front of a desktop or at a laptop. Uh, that that you're, you you spend more time on the pages, you read more long form journalism. So I think that may be a direction to go. Just, uh, so in, in some respects, uh, and this might be throwing a bomb in the room, but um, because I think journalism has uh, has to deal with its own sort of uh, tension on this, which is uh, in some respects what you're describing is what Clay Shirky calls filter failure, um, and that's actually there is a, a lot of opportunity to create a business around filter failure. Uh, and if you had done that and your last name had been Huffington, you would be <laughs> making lots of money, right? And so, I, and I, I don't want to throw that bomb in the room. Um, I'll th I'll try and pick another one, Matt Drudge. Although in this crowd, that's also a bomb. <laughs> Um, the point is, is that, that there is a way to sort of, um, you know, take this idea of curation, which is a way to serve readers, um, and, and I don't think that that has to be a, 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 you know, a dirty word um, be, if, if it is in service of, of readers' needs. So there's actually a business opportunity there because I don't think there can be too much information in the world, but there can be too much information for one person, and so I think journalists need to actually step up and own curation as opposed to sort of you know, have this uh, internal struggle with it. The only reason we have this internal struggle with it is because it feels like it's outsiders who are doing it. 
I agree with all of that. And I'd also say that, I mean, one nice thing about having, you know, this abundance of information out there is that it gives permission to people to create their own information, you know? So, um, you know, journalism before used to be about sort of limitation, you know, and what belongs within, you know, the confines of the newspaper or the confines of the broadcast. And now we're having, you know, an inversion of that entire model where, again, Clay Shirky, you know, it's sort of create first and then you filter. And I think that, you know, Certainly there can be some sort of cognitive problems presented by that, but I think by and large for, for society, that is an immensely good thing because it, it gives permission to people to create. Terrific. Next question. Let's go to you in the second row. Hi. Um, I'm Caitlin from UMass Amherst. Um, so in UMass, we've, in our journalism program, we've talked a lot about um, like doing partnerships with like local media. Um, and so I was wondering if you guys have any suggestions about, um, that's my question, thank you. Uh, do you have any uh, suggestions for, for entrepreneurial projects, uh, for getting funding slash partnerships slash uh, sponsorships from established media organizations to help you kind of like, you know, get the funding for, for projects that you really want to get out there? Dave, Dave has an answer. One thing that does come to mind, um, and this was actually told me from someone at the Washington Post, I was at this conference, um, where we got to ask people questions, and I, and I you know, um, asked a question of like, you know, there's a lot of, of difficulty sometimes collaborating with, with mainstream news organizations, and the best piece of advice that I got actually was, uh, have a champion on the inside. And actually that kind of pissed me off, because I want to say I shouldn't have to have a champion on the inside to be able to figure it out, but, uh, but I have also found that that is actually very, very helpful. Um, if you're able to have someone on the inside of that organization who can champion you, it goes a lot smoother. And I wish I had a better answer that was like, you know, uh, go get them. Uh, but, uh, you know, if I want to be, if I, an honest answer is um, see if you can find someone on the inside that can champion it for you. Okay, let's go to you all the way in the back with the black shirt. Hi there, this question uh, probably anybody on the panel can answer, but it's probably directed at Megan the most since you guys look at a lot of different projects. Um, and Tway, you were mentioning that coming out, out as a young uh, journalism student that you're not really uh, looking to sort of start your own entrepreneurial website. And it was an interesting point that, you know, you've got you to build this website and you've got to sort of create legitimacy for it. And there's that challenge. What I've seen out in San Diego, I'm from New Media Rights in San Diego, my name's Art Neal. And, um, out there, there's a, pro there's a couple projects. One is actually called the Watchdog Institute. One thing that's interesting about the Watchdog Institute, unlike some of our other new innovative projects like Voice of San Diego and some others, is they're actually going with this kind of syndication model and working with established journalism organizations like the young uh, lady just mentioned. And I'm sort of curious, um, I know it's still in this experimental stage, but I I'm just curious what people are seeing in terms of, of uh, you know, where things are going, uh, in these two models. One is create your own site, your own destination site. And I know I know you can do both, but there's another model that's sort of arising too, which is the syndication, work with established media, and, and how, um, how well can that work for the future entrepreneurs, the people that are trying to um, create really content businesses as opposed to maybe spend their time worrying about uh, uh, how to manipulate the website and things like that. It's a great question because it, it is very much a real concern and a real tension. Um, I report on ProPublica and you know California Watch and other sort of nonprofits um, to focus on that sector and Voice of San Diego as well. And it's very much you know for them attention. You know how much traffic should we sort of keep to ourselves because even, even though they're nonprofits, you know they still have to show traffic results to their funders and you know all that kind of stuff. And then how much should we focus on uh, distributing things out? And I don't know that we found necessarily um, a good answer. I think it's something that everyone's trying to sort of think about, but what I do know is that journalists fundamentally want to get their stuff out there. I mean, I think that's kind of a universal truth. Um, you know, we want our stuff to be read, we want it to be seen, we want it to have impact. And so, you know, I, I can see things sort of going more toward the, you know, syndication uh, collaboration side of things because it just, you know, economically, um, it, it can make more sense, um, you know, and just from a sort of efficiency standpoint. I mean, you, you're distributing your stuff, you know, much more broadly in that way. So does that answer your question? Yeah, okay. Great, other questions? Third row. Hi, so um, you talked a lot about um, basically creating, you know, filling a void, but um, Jackie, I think you talked a little about if, 
you don't want to create something else to improve on something that's already there. And Toy, I know you talked um, that you didn't like your college's paper, so you created another website. And I know, um, I know my college and the junior college I went to as well, struggling a lot with, they both have print editions, but now they're trying to transition to online. They do have online presence, but so what would you suggest to a newsroom that is trying to either step away from their print edition completely or to get more traffic onto their online site to try and transition into an online publication only? Um, the, the most successful thing that we've found is um, sharing it on Facebook, um, but just through personal sharing and then our friends read it and then they share it. Um, but also uh, Reddit, I'm not sure if uh, people are familiar with Reddit, but um, it's, it's kind of like Dig, um, but uh, yeah, better. <laughs> so, um, um, and actually that's how Re I think Rebecca Black and for the song Friday got really popular. Um, so I think um, we're starting to post on that as well. Um, and just once, I feel like once you can prove to not only your newsroom, but to the school that you're getting a lot of hits and uh, your content is getting out there, um, then people will place uh, less important importance on the, the print edition and um, hopefully they'll like you on Facebook and or make your website their home page. Um, especially in the case of a student paper, a change can come from either side. It can come from the top down or also from the bottom up. Uh, if you want to have more of an online presence, multimedia I think is key. And uh, so the, the training, it, it could just be one or two people, change agents in the newsroom, who go out and teach themselves you know, how to shoot video, how to take audio, make podcasts, and uh, put it online, and then spreading that to the rest of the newsroom. Or it could be someone uh, who's uh, in an editor position who, you know, they decide, okay, let's do this this semester, let's try it. And then it's just a matter of doing it. You know, you don't have to be producing professional quality video, you don't need the best uh, equipment, uh, but just a matter of putting it out there and then also sharing it. Uh, um, and um, it's an iterative process. It won't happen overnight. Uh, a friend of mine who, uh, who graduated journalism and then went to go work in a, a newsroom that uh, has a print product and also uh, has an online presence, but they didn't really have much multimedia, but that was his background. He was hired to go in there and train the, the photographers on video, and uh, it took actually a year from the time that was proposed to when he actually is going to do the training session. So just be patient and work at it. Something that I hear so often from student editors and student leaders of journalistic organizations is that their staff doesn't want to do anything online. They think that print is very prestigious and they're having a hard time motivating people. Have any of you dealt with that and what do you do? What do you say to someone who has that position? I think Dave wants to say something. Well, I, I can tell. I want to say something, but uh, <laughs> uh, you, know, uh, I, you guys could probably talk more about the student newspaper thing, but one thing that, that I, I noticed sometimes, which is interesting, you know, we've been talking about young entrepreneurial journalism, but I have, you know, and, and we were sort of saying it's not an age mm -hmm. thing, it's a mindset right. thing. I've met a lot of student journalists who, uh, you know, uh, f you know, have this image of uh, Woodward and Bernstein and they want to put a, uh, you know, a, a card in their hat and, and, um, <laughs> and, and I can understand that, you know, there's a nostalgia there. Um, and, you know, uh, for better or for worse, I notice that. So, again, I guess this is just to point out that, it, again, it's not an age thing. Uh, there is a mindset, and I think young, some young people are more stuck in that mindset. They feel like they, they almost feel like robbed of something, you know, like they missed their chance at being Woodward and Bernstein because of the, uh, you know, economic realities. Um, and, I, and I think, that, again, it, it sort of, a, a, you know, recognizes a tension in what I would say is the journalism community, right? Because the journalism community is different from the journalism industry. There's the industry, and then there's the community, um, and part of a big part of the community are people who work within the industry, and so there's this tension uh, that I really see in a lot of student journalists. I don't know what to tell them um, other than to suck it up. Uh, you know, <laughs> it's that you, you were born too late. But um, but but also, you know, I mean, that's that's being me and I or flippant. The, the real answer is is to get them excited. Uh, because there are so many more opportunities and possibilities. Um, it doesn't have the quite, you know, again, if you have that nostalgia, it, you, you can't get that nostalgia back. But um, there's a sort of a, a founding, uh, a founding uh, time right now where you can sort of get people energized about being part of, uh, if it is a revolution, uh, you know, s someone here can be Paul Revere or whatever. You know. that, that's kind of cool, right? <laughs> 
Well, and I, I just add to that, um, there's a really cool site called backtweets.com. Have you guys heard of that? Um, basically, it's, it's yeah, backtweets, and you uh, put in the URL of a particular story, and you can see all the tweets that have, you know, linked to that story. And I find that, you know, just knowing that your story has that kind of life online and is being read by all these people that you wouldn't know about, it just sort of gets you into the mindset of this sort of network networked world that we're in, um, and so it's a really cool thing to sort of show people and a good way to convince them. <laughs> Other questions? Yes, you, oops, you in the white t-shirt. Yeah, this question is for David. Uh, specifically, I, I look at it as, like, you could write local stories, state stories, national stories, international stories regarding people that, uh, like, would actually want to pay for it, and so how was it regarding your strategy for who's, like, who exactly you're trying to get to donate? <laughs> to hear what story and our, like, yeah. So uh, Spot Us, again, we got started with a grant from the Knight Foundation, and one of Knight Foundation's core principles is sort of local geographic communities. And so uh, so I said local geographic communities. Uh, well, so we started, we were only doing stories in the San Francisco Bay Area. Now we actually do local stories uh, all across the country. But the story itself has to sort of have a geographic tie. It has to be a story that, uh, could not just sort of happen anywhere, right? We won't tackle national stories. Although, uh, because my night grant has, uh, my original night grant is done, I've actually started uh, pushing my elbows out and taking some stories that aren't necessarily geographically tied. Um, that said, you know, from from that start, what I would say, what I, I've actually said from the very beginning is, um, you know, national and international stories I think are easier to fundraise for. Um, by the very nature of doing a local story, you have a smaller audience uh, that would be interested. In fact, I, I experienced that firsthand when, when I first started Spot Us. A lot of people said, love the idea, don't give a crap about any of your stories. I live <laughs> in, you know, the East Coast or the South, whatever, and all I had was, you know, Bay Area stories. Um, so again, I, I actually encourage people who want to experiment in this concept of community-funded reporting to think about doing it at a national or international level. Um, I think it could actually work. Um, I, I think someone could do it with far more success, actually, uh, which is why I'm starting. And I've already seen in some of our more spread out pitches that uh, it, it actually is easier to fundraise for. Mm -hmm. That said, I wonder if it's easier to have an impact if you have a political agenda, if you have ideas that you want to get out to the public, if it's easier to have a smaller focus and, and focus on a community or a locality. Do you all agree or disagree? Um, well, I agree. I think that the, the biggest thing for us was to show uh, the BC community that we actually care about them, that things that happen to them, um, that those things aren't just a news story for us, that you know, it's, we're part of their community. Um, and that's kind of been the best way to um, give an identity to ourselves um, and readership. Other questions? One here in the front row. So, I don't, um, will you correct me if I'm wrong, did you say that one of your goals was to have transparent news and, or what? To increase transparency and participation in the process of journalism. Okay, so why is that your goal? I mean, if we're talking about media reform and everything, how did you, at what point were you inspired or did you understand that that was important? For all of you, but I just, because right. you talked about your goal, so. Um, again, I, I think that um, I, I look at news uh, and journalism as a way where people get uh, informed and become engaged in their local, you know, if you're doing a local story, their local democracy or whatever. Um, and, you know, that used to be more passive, right? It was sort of uh, an, uh, a story would come to you and that would influence how you would or wouldn't vote or et cetera. Um, but there's a, in the end, I, I think journalism has an educational role, right? Um, as, as well as a couple other things, you know, you could say to, you know, um, why am I blanking on that, that classic phrase, to empower the weak and... Uh, afflict the comfortable thank you. and afflict comfort the, the afflicted. Yeah. Um, but, but I think by increasing, to, to answer your question, to inc by increasing transparency and participation in the process of journalism, uh, again, people get directly engaged in that which uh, it lubricates our democracy uh, or our communities. Um, so I, I think, again, another way to explain it is if you look at Spot Us, this is me talking about Spot Us specifically as opposed to the principles, but 
an application of those principles. Um, if you look at Spadas, it's kind of like a menu, right? And if you were to walk into a, a restaurant and the waiter told you what you were going to eat for dinner, you'd walk out. That's a ridiculous idea, right? Who are you to tell me what I'm eating for dinner? I'm going to order. Um, but that's kind of what newspapers or news organizations have traditionally done. Not because they were evil or mean or conniving. That was just the only means of communication, right? Here's the news. Um, but I think by getting people to say, here's what I want, uh, they'll actually be part of that process. In this case, both helping actually fund it, uh, but they'll also be engaged in it, right? The idea is, is that now they're part of that process of journalism. They care more about what's going to happen. They're going to be more engaged and involved in uh, that which informs our communities. Can I ask another question? Sure. <laughs> um, just on a personal level for all of you, but like, what, why do you care? Do you know what I mean? Like, why is that important to you? Because I think a lot of people can, because um, what you're saying is, I t totally understand, but w why? Is that important to you personally, and why did you decide to do this work? It's a total personal question. I'm just wondering, like, what inspired you, or why did you, how did you know this was your passion? Um, I mean, it, that's sort of a, a it, it is a personal question, right? Um, uh, you know, it comes down to just the experiences that I had. I guess when I was actually an undergrad, um, I was a philosophy and rhetoric double major, which are both useless. Um, but I got really interested in um, uh, the exchange of information as a way that society evolves. And uh, it was either that or be a lawyer. Um, <laughs> I was either going to be, uh, you know, part of what it means to exchange information and how that evolves society, or or, or be a lawyer. Um, where to start? <laughs> I guess like I, I decided early on in my life that um, my what I wanted to do was just sort of make people's lives better. I mean, that's a really broad statement. So how do you go about achieving that? And I think uh, one of the things in society, like what, what makes people feel a sense of accomplishment, I think it's doing things, not just being passive, not just consuming <coughs> things and accepting things as they come to you, but actually creating things. So create creation over consumption. And uh, so one of the ways of doing that is to uh, train people, to educate people, and also to provi provide them the tools necessary to be able to do that. And it's really empowering. So um, there's a lot of debate about citizen journalism, just as an example. Why do citizen journalism? Right? And I think it's not so much, uh, on the one hand, it, these days it can help fill a gap in news coverage, but that's just one side of the picture. The other side of the picture is when citizens engage in acts of journalism, they are, as David was saying, they're becoming involved in the process. They become invested in it. They become invested in their communities. Suddenly the outcome matters to them. And you have, when you have a whole group of people that are like that, that's a great community. So. We have time for one more question right here in the fourth row. David, I want to go back to your example just now of um, dinner and um, you know, you not telling me what I'm going to eat. Um, if, if I were to take that analogy a step further and say, okay, David, you can choose your meal, but it's going to cost you $10. Or you could let me choose your meal, and it's going to be 50 cents. <laughs> so how do you sort of work that model so that people really want to spend the $10 to have the choice? That's an interesting scenario, because in my mind, I, I always think the, the, this is maybe, again, playing with the analogy too much, but the restaurants where you don't get a choice are really the snazzy restaurants where, you know, it's very pretty, right? And, I, and um, you know, I, I think, let me see if I understand your question. You're sort of, if I understand it correctly, it's the question of whether or not people will actually go for the quality things. Is that kind of what you're asking about? Yeah, I'm asking if, I'm asking if they'll go for the quality things, but also if you think that you can... I guess sell people on the idea that what you have to author, offer is worth the ten dollars because people are not used to paying for right. information. Right. Um, well, you know, and this is maybe a, a skeptical answer for myself because um, there's that's actually a really loaded question. I could talk about it for a long time, but one thing I say is, you know, we often ask, you know, when is journalism going to be sustainable? When's it going to be sustainable? When's it going to be sustainable? And on a skeptical evening, I'll tell you, it's not, and it never was sustainable. Um, advertising is a very sustainable business. Classifieds is a very sustainable business. Journalism is not. They used to be married, and now they're uh, separated and occasionally talk. 
Um, so, so you know, one thing that I would say is, is I don't know if what Spot Us is, or you know, what I'm experimenting is, is a silver bullet. It's cer it's certainly not a silver bullet. Um, the question is, is how much of a revenue stream it can be in addition uh, to other revenue streams. Um, and I do think actually that people will make uh, uh, intelligent uh, and, and healthy choices about what journalism they want, especially if you provide them uh, those choices. Uh, and, and you know, you look at the New York Times pay meter, um, and, and in some respects that is a recognition that uh, people will pay for it, not for direct access, but just out of a sense of like, oh, it's the New York Times and I'll, I'll just give you 15 bucks a month because, for whatever, not for access because they can get around it, but just because they sort of feel like they should. Um, so I think that, that uh, another way of saying this is uh, we're actually in a very early stage here where people are starting to open up their wallets. The question is, is why would they open up their wallets? Why would they continue to open up their wallets? If you do it one month for the New York Times, why would you do it the next month? There has to be a reason, an incentive. Um, and I think that that's kind of what we need to start playing with and figuring out. And you know, again, I don't think we've, I've necessarily hit the nail directly on the head and, and we've built a house, but uh, I like to think maybe I've nicked it and it's you know, one of those nails that goes in crooked and it's really annoying and you have to bang it back out again. So I, I think that, that it's about you know, experimentation and pushing things forward and, and I, we won't know exactly what we can accomplish until we start asking. I think that's a wonderful note to end on. Let's give a, a wonderful round of applause to our wonderful panelists. They were all great, thank you.